Hello, in this podcast, we're going to be looking at agriculture, and the learning target of this podcast is to describe the impact of both the Green Revolution and genetic modified organisms. First, the original way that agriculture was done is either called traditional agriculture or subsistence agriculture. And this first picture here shows a typical way that it's done. It's using human labor and draft animals. And this system is still used today in developing countries, and it's used by 2.7 billion people. This is different from today's in that it still uses polyculture, which means that many plants are planted together. And in America, one way this is sort of seen is in this picture here. If you look at, he if you look at this picture here, this is the way the American Indians used to do uh, some planting called the Three Sisters, which is corn, squash, and beans. Clearly what happened is that clearly what happened is that the corn acting as a pole for the bean which is a vine to grow up grow on. And those two growing together, when you put the corn and the beans together, that gives a complete protein. And also the corn draws the nitrogen out of the soil and the bean is a legume, and the legumes, remember, have those nodules with the bacteria in it, so it's adding nitrogen to the soil. So the two sort of work together. And what the squash does is that the squash ha is a low-growing plant, and they have big leaves, and those leaves are protecting the soil from erosion. So this type, that type of agriculture works quite well. Uh, in the tropics, the type of agriculture that they use, particularly in the tropical rainforest, is called slash and burn. The problem that they have in the tropical rainforests is this, is that the soil is very poor quality soil because, as we saw in the, earlier in this unit, is that because it rains so much, nutrients get washed away. When you slash and burn, the, burn, when you slash and burn, the burning puts the nutrients, puts nutrients into the soil, so if we f so for a few years, the soil has nutrients, and for a few years you've got good soil, so they farm for a few years. And then they let it lie fallow for 10 to 30 years for the forest to regrow. And then they'll come back and, and uh, farm there again. So slash and burn under that. Then we come to, in the mid 20th century, the first green revolution. And this picture here, you see how it's quite different from what we saw before. Gone are the three sisters. Instead, we just see one plant. And gone are the draft animals. Instead, you see huge machines that are doing it. So it's all one culture and monoculture. And one big result of this, if you look at the graph over here, we're just using a few plants. And also, we're producing lots and lots of them. So the yields increase greatly. And here's some notes on how it was done. Three main steps in how the Green Revolution was done. First is just use a few key crops, corn, wheat, and rice and they are selectively bred for high yield and growing in monocultures. And the second step is to use large amounts of fertilizer, pesticides, and water to greatly increase the yield. Fertilizer is a limiting factor so they can grow a lot. Pesticides kills the pests, uh, and also herbicides too kills the weeds. Uh, that will limit their growth, and water is another limiting factor. And then multiple cropping where that same area in the course of a year, uh, there's just grow several crops over the course of the year, and that will increase the yield also. Here are the results. Here are the results. Mexico is the first place where the Green Revolution was tried. In the process of 20 years, Mexico went from importing half its food to exporting half a million, and corn yields jumped from 25 bushels per acre to 130 bushels per acre. There's also an impact. And some impacts are positive and some impacts are negative. A positive impact is that the food production has outstripped population. So we learned earlier about Malthus and how Malthus predicted that the human, that human population was heading towards a crash because the, because food product, because food production grows geometrically and population grows exponentially. But now it's, what's happening is that food production is growing much, much faster than was predicted by Malthus. Also, since 1970, it, this Green Revolution has expanded to tropical and subtropical climates. Back in the 1950s, 1960s, it was primarily just for the temperate. Now, here are some 
negative impacts of it. Out of 50,000 edible plant species, we're only using a few of them. Gen and also, of the crops that we use, genetic diversity is decreasing. Like in Sri Lanka, they once planted 2,000 varieties of rice. Now they plant only five. And, the, and because the genetic diversity is so much less, that means they are much more vulnerable to diseases, to bad weather, and to pests. Also, pesticides are overused. And the results of that would be that it can pollute the water, it can harm non-pests, and there are other impacts for that also, and we'll be getting into that in the next chapter. There's a lot of habitat destruction because when, you, when we make farmland, that's destroying the habitat that was there originally. Also, starting in 1970 and then getting, much, at least in the laboratory, and then starting in the late 80s, we started applying it, much, much more so now, we have genetic engineering. And genetic engineering is altering an organism's DNA to produce desirable traits or eliminate undesirable traits. Prior to this, we only used selective breeding. And we still use selective breeding. And the diagram we see over here is basically how it's done, how we transfer genes from, could be, one, could be from one species to another species. Where, which is actually what's shown here, where first we take some cells, and then it's, and then we separate those into a culture, and then we take in a bacteria that already has the altered that that has the gene inside of it that we desire. It could be from bacteria, or it could be from another kingdom besides bacteria. In this case, it looks like it's uh, something. You see how it says herbicide added select the cells? So, so, in other words, this most likely this one has a gene that's added that, that gives it uh, resistance to an herbicide, and the bacteria that have that resistance that have the gene will be eliminated by that herbicide. And that's added to the cells. Then those cells are turned into an embryo and then into a new plant. And then you have a plant with, in this case, which is uh, herbicide resistance. These organisms are, have two basic names. They can be called genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. They can also be called transgenic organisms. In the United States, 60% of processed food contains GMOs. In Europe, I believe still they don't, have, don't use any. It's been banned. Here are some uses of GMOs. They can produce crops with pest resistance, wider tolerance levels to frost, drought, low nutrient soils, salty soils, etc., which can be very good here, not just here in developed countries, but also in developing countries. It can improve the protein or vitamin content of the crop. It can incorporate oral vaccines into foods such as bananas for use in developing nations. Just imagine you go to the doctor to get, to get say, vaccinated for the measles, and instead of getting a shot, you eat a bag of potato chips. And also, animals can be modified to grow faster or produce pharmaceuticals in their milk. They can also be modified for pest resistance and weed control. Prior to this, the farms would be sprayed with a with an herbicide or a pesticide. They'd be very careful to pick an herbicide that would kill the weeds but would not kill the plant, and that could be hard to find. But if you can find if you can find the gene that produces resistance to the pesticide, they can end up with uh, spraying that, and your plant survives. And that's what Roundup Ready does. So the weeds get killed, and the Roundup Ready plants survive. Or what we have here on top here is that, or rather than spraying for a pesticide, which would kill the, say, the insect pests, if the plant is able to produce the pesticide itself, then the only insects that get killed are the ones that try to eat the plant. And you don't end up with a lot of good insects that are really helpful for the environment getting killed. Here are some concerns with genetic engineering. One is that GMOs might produce super weeds resistance to pesticide. Like what if you're growing herbicide resistant sunflowers and then the sunflowers will breed with the wild sunflowers and all of a sudden you've got a batch of wild sunflowers that are super weeds. Also native biodiversity may be reduced by producing novel toxins. Technology also may only be available to the rich, making family farms uncompetitive and driving poor nations further into poverty. 
because the biotechnology countries are there for profit. And one thing that also that they're doing is that they make the seeds so that they won't be able to produce new, that the plants won't be able to produce new seeds. So they can't make, so the farmers can't make their own seed stock. They have to keep coming back to buy more. And plus those are also can be more expensive. Genetically engineered seeds are more expensive than regular seeds, and there's also concern. And there's also concern that genetically modified animals could escape from cat from captivity and not compete their wild relatives. And an example I have here is that salmon that be genetically modified, so they make more growth hormone, they grow seven times faster. Now, government policies are also very important in agriculture and helping us produce enough food for everybody. In the United States, the government subsidizes certain crops so that during bad years, like what we had this year when we had one of the worst droughts, right, they, that uh, our farmers can do well. And one problem with that is that it encourages farmers to plant all the land that they can and even the land they shouldn't, land that is easily eroded. The Food and Drug Administration declined to require labeling on food that contains GMOs. So when you go to Pathmark and or another supermarket and decide to buy GM and decide to buy food, you don't know if it contains GMOs. And the reason why is they say that it's so similar to the traditional that there's it doesn't need to be labeled. And GMOs are banned in Europe, so the so different countries require different things. And in developing countries, another problem with government policies is that farmers prefer to pay, they want to make money, so they will plant cash crops, crops that we want here in the United States or people want in Europe or in Japan, and they grow them for export, and instead of crops for local consumption. One goal that we should have in agriculture is for sustainable agriculture, where we are able to increase our food supplies for the growing population while maintaining the long-term health of resources. We need to be able to protect the soil and water resources. We need to be able to increase productivity. We need to be able to develop alternative foods. Uh, we also need to be able to eat at low trophic levels because remember, when you do high trophic levels, you have to have the lower trophic levels support the higher trophic levels. And you also need to be able to reduce the loss from pests. Also, increase the self-sufficiency of the developing nations. Increase the loss for better distribution of food and sustainable production methods and ending wars. Now, a lot of this we're going to talk about here is how we can, how we can reach some of those goals. Protecting soil and water with minimum tillage. So you don't have to plow as many times when you lose, use a lot of herbicides. And that if you look at the picture here, you see there's a lot of crop residue over there. And that's what that's doing is it's protecting the soil and it's conserving water. And I'll just show you a short little video here on how they can do that. And sometimes even without herbicides, do it organically. Contour farming is another way of protecting the soil and the water. Look at the picture here. The reason why these aren't straight is because the lines are the lines of the crops are following the contours. It's it's staying at the same elevation, and so that when it rains, and it's going to reduce the runoff rate. The, the water is not going to run as quickly, and that will reduce the soil erosion 50 to 80 percent, and the soil will be able to hold on to the water better. Strip cropping is another way, and strip cropping, if you look over here, we've got one type of crop, and over here we have another type of crop, and that alternation will reduce both wind and water erosion. Terracing is another way of protecting soil and water, and you see here that unlike the that one difference between this and the contour farming that we saw before is that the plants are grown are flat, little t terraces are, little, are made into the soil. And that slows down the water erosion quite a bit that w because the water has to, can't just go straight down the slope. It has to, it, it goes down probably like in little waterfalls and then it stops because it's flat. When you combine that with the minimum tillage and put contour farming in there too, the erosion rate is reduced 98%. But these things are expensive to make, and if using large farm equipment, this may not work because the terraces may interfere with that. When there is erosion, sometimes you can end up with gullies, and we covered that in an earlier 
vodcast. And the gullies are a sign of rapid water erosion. So reclamation of those gullies are very important. That can be done by planting it with rapidly growing plants or building small dams to slow down the water flow rate. And here it looks like they literally filled in the gully itself. Shelter is another way of reducing the erosion as a way of protecting soil and water. And in this picture here, you, see the you can see the shelter belts. Those are rows of trees. And that prevents the wind erosion, and it can also prevent snow from being blown away. And provides a habitat for pest-eating insects and pollinators. It can also prevent desertification by stopping the sand from blowing. And China's green wall is like that. Remember in the last, last podcast I showed you how, chi how the Gobi Desert in China is expanding. And these shelter belts are one of the tools that China is using to slow down that rate of desertification. Another way that you can make sure that these methods are used by the farmers are by laws. And U.S. farm bills are a way of making sure that takes place. Because a lot of farmers don't want to do all these things because a lot of these methods are expensive. So the 1985 farm bill that will pay farmers to protect their most vulnerable lands to erosion for 10 years by planting trees, grasses, or cover crops. So they don't lose money by not farming those lands. And then the 1996 Farm Bill, what that does is that the farmers will develop erosion plans in exchange for being able to get other benefits where they can get federal crop insurance, they can get subsidies where the government just gives them money or some other things could happen too. And the result of this was that one and a half million farmers signed on and they developed plans in conjunction with the U.S. Soil Conservation Service. So a quarter of U.S. farmland fell under this plan. Another part of the, of the 96 Farm Bill was the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And every year that provided $200 million and it helped farmers both technically and financially with conservation. And the net result of this was that for every dollar that was invested, two dollars were saved in reducing erosion and pollution. Now for irrigation, irrigation basically is watering crops. Problems with irrigation is evaporation. Like if you're, say in the summer, you're walking around here in, Spring, in, in Springfield Gardens or anywhere else in Queens, or, and you see people watering plants if they're, say you've got a sprinkler out. When the, spring, when the water, when the sprinkler is going, if it's going in the daytime on a hot summer day, some of that water won't even reach the ground. It gets evaporated. That problem has to be avoided. A lot of water comes out of well water, and if we're using more water than comes in through from the rain, then the groundwater is going to be, slowly be used up. And, and salinization is the water become, is the ground eventually becoming more and more salty. And water logging is overwatering. Water sensors can help in that. It can tell when to water so the water, so the soil has become too dry or too wet. Watering at night is a way to avoid the, is, is a way to really bring down the evaporation problem. Another way to bring down the evaporation problem is uh, to transport water in pipes, or if you can't, if you don't use the pipes, at least line the ditches so that the water will reach where you want to water and not just go, not just sink into the ground before it gets to your crops. Here's a very common method of irrigation. If you're flowing across the United States, you might have seen scenes like this and wondered what it is, and now you're going to find out, where you see these green circles. Those are farms, and it's those circles are green because what they do, you see this line over here, that is a center irrigation pivot. If you look here, it's a close-up of it, and basically that waters the plants and it goes around in a circle pivoting around the center. The problem there, of course, is evaporation, and one way you can make that better is have the water point down rather than point up. That way the water spends less time in the air and there will be less water to evaporate. And of course you could water at night too. You can, a way you can have the water spend even less time in the air is to use something called drip irrigation. And you see in this picture here, all these pipes that are along the ground here going to each of the plants. What's, this is a drip irrigation system. Nothing gets really sprayed out into the air. The water is brought 
really close. If you look at this close up over here, you see you got this little tiny sprinkler barely spraying the water, and the water is basically applied directly to the roots. So it's barely exposed to the air, very little water is evaporated that way. Now for fertilizers, we have to fertilize the soil. Otherwise, we're not going to get the amount of yield that we need. Without these synthetic food fertilizers, our food production would fall at least 40%. One problem with it is that it only partially restores the soil fertility. It doesn't have everything that the soil needs. That is, it doesn't have everything that the plants take away when they grow. It's good to use organic fertilizers. These will not just increase the yield, like synthetic fertilizers, they'll also increase water retention. They will decrease the leaching, so the fewer the nutrients will get washed down deep into the soil. It will also decrease pH shifts, and decreasing pH shifts actually in turn decrease the leaching. Organic fertilizers, well, there are two kinds. One is animal waste, and so by using organic fertilizers, they'll solve two problems, because if an animal farmer has lots of animals, so they can produce as much waste as a city, and these farms, unlike a city, are not required to treat the manure. And that manure could just get washed into the rivers and the lakes and cause lots and lots of pollution, which it does. And we'll get into that in another chapter. But if you take that waste and turn it into organic fertilizer, that stuff can can then be used uh, sustainably and usefully. Another type of fertilizer that's organic is called green manure. And those basically are leguminous plants like alfalfa and clover. And if you remember back in an earlier chapter where we learned about the nitrogen cycle, there are plants which have a mutualistic relationship with bacteria and these bacteria are able to fix nitrogen out of the air and leguminous plants are like that, alfalfa and clover are like that, so they grow those plants and then they plow those into the soil and that fertilizes the soil. To make, to make more sustainable agriculture can produce even higher yielding plants than what we have now. We need one way is to protect the wild varieties because the ones since since what we're growing now, we have a very low genetic diversity since we only have a few varieties. The wild varieties have the genetic diversity and we can find the genes that we need. And we can also produce the higher yield through such methods as selective breeding, making hybrids where you take two different, where you take two different uh, cultivars and you breed them together and the mixture of the two can sometimes be a much more robust plant and also that we can produce higher yields through genetic engineering. Uh, most crop plants are annuals. That means that the plant lives for a year and then it dies. Corn is an annual, rice is an annual, and wheat is an annual. I can remember the lab that we did on net primary productivity. And remember that the grass there, the, that grew very, very quickly, but if you look at the on the bag there it says to only use it for repair and not long term because it is an annual. If you use that to plant your, use that grass there for planting your whole lawn, winter will, co winter will come by and then the, the grass will all die and by next spring you'll have just have bare ground. Perennials, on the other hand, would be much better for the soil because when the annuals die the whole plant dies so you've got to plant everything. Perennials will only, maybe the top part of the plant will die, the roots stay and that will hold on to the soil and prevent erosion. And we can also find new plants, some that can be more nutritious and also, and, or, also or just produce higher yields. There, as I said earlier in the podcast, there are 50,000 edible plant species and we're only using a few of them. Now we come to our concluding questions. Question number one, what are the three steps of the green revolution? Question number two, what is one benefit and one concern about genetic engineering? Question number three, what does it mean for agriculture to be sustainable? And question number four, describe two ways to reduce soil erosion. That concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.